What are you doing up? It's 4 a.m. I'm feeding my fish. You can't smoke in here. Uh, it's a study break. You said you quit. I'll quit after this one. Why isn't the smoke detector going off? Broken. That's not safe. I'm sure we'll be okay. Remember when you started that fire? You remind me daily. Not daily. It was a long time ago. You had a chemistry set, set and you made me hold the beaker. You wanted to play. You got it for your birthday. I got it for Christmas. No, it was your birthday because it was in yellow wrapping paper with pink and green and white balloons on it. That was for a birthday. If it was for Christmas, it would have been Greek Christmas paint wrapping, which changed every year. I love that set. We played a scientist and assistant. I was assistant. You called me Igor. I never called you Igor. But it was fun. And you said we were going to make a bomb, and you told me it was a pretend bomb. I was just messing around. You said you were going to blow up the school. What? I never would say that. You did say that. You make me sound like a Columbine psycho or something. You did say that. Didn't mean it. Every time we played, there was a mission. Like one time we saved a sick dog. You never saved a sick dog. We invented stuff, and one time you made a fake arm and it could move. That was awesome. I remember that. And the volcano exploded all over the laundry room on the clean clothes. That was funny. Mom was mad. But you laughed. We were laughing and we were laughing so hard. And then mom came down and was mad. And then you started crying and she blamed me, but you were laughing too. I didn't know what I was doing. As usual. Sometimes I would look at you and think this is all just one big act. Like you get to have the tooth fairy and Santa and the Easter bunny forever. And if I ever told you the truth, mom would get mad at me. Like I was corrupting you. But how could you stay so? What? Innocent? What do you mean? It must be nice to be a kid your whole life. And then you burned me. It didn't burn you. You made me hold the beaker. You wanted to, you begged to. You said, I gotta do your job. It was a mistake. No kid beat you up and you wanted to bomb the whole school and you made me hold the test too. You beat me up because of you. I was fucking defending you. It wasn't, if it wasn't me, it was going to be you. It's funny how you remember everything but that. That's how I know my memory's right. Off. It was unscrewed. Somebody unscrewed it. Ram, turn it off. It's because you're smoking. You're going to start another fire. Not smoking. He's going to start another fire. You're going to start another fire. Ram. You're going to start another fire. You're going to start another fire. You're going to start another fire. It's bad for your health. Secondhand smoke is even deadlier. Okay, okay. You're right, all right? You're right. So shut the fuck up. You're right. I'm the big asshole. You're the poor, suffering victim. I didn't want to hold the beaker. You made me. You wanted to be a Igor. There, I quit. We end. Thank you, Dan. No, 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 thank you, Teddy. Uh, so I would love to invite Jeremy to join us. Hello. Oh, there's the little guy. Uh, close my window. Oh. Uh, so that was a scene, a, a relatively newer scene from The Importance of Being uh, by Jeremy J. Camps, who's joining us right now. Um, we've been working on this play with uh, Spectrum Theater Ensemble for a while. Uh, do you want to talk about how you got to know us and, and how you developed this piece? Sure, and um, thank you, uh, Teddy and Dan, for doing such a great job, as always. <laughs> uh, this this um, 
I, I think my with Spectrum, I started in 2015 or 2016 in the summer and came and did a little bit of, of work together for the, um, the values piece that everyone did. Um, but then coming out of that, Clay um, had the vision for us to develop a play with seven members of the ensemble. So over the course of about a year, I would come for three days at a time. Um, I, live, I, I lived in Brooklyn at the time and we would do workshops, we'd play, we'd tell stories, we'd go on tangents, lots and lots of tangents. <laughs> We, um, uh, this, this pages actually didn't come till pretty deep into the process. And at that point, I think the first day that I brought some pages, they were sort of loosely inspired by things that we, that we'd been, that come up in our time together, but none of those pages are in the script at all. So it really kind of grew over time and little by little, um, we found the play and, um, and then had a, a really amazing reading at the end of it, uh, which was. I think two years ago now, no, a year and a half ago. And then another reading about just over a year ago. Right. And so in that time, now, since I don't go up as regularly, um, the it's just been the readings, but in even in those pockets, the conversations I've had with you two and Clay and anyone who's seen the reading has helped me continue to sort of hone and develop the script. And like you said, this being one of the um, newer scenes coming out of the last reading, uh, focusing on the relationship of the brothers, because really it's a play about uh, siblings, two brothers and a sister. Um, and uh, uh, so, yeah, so this was a play that, a scene that we felt was maybe lacking to, to get to see these two um, a little more in depth and know a little bit about their history. So uh, here it is. And it was so great to, to hear it and uh, continue to develop this play together. Absolutely. Uh, Dan, did you have any thoughts about the process or questions for Jeremy? Well, when I read the script, I was intrigued, intrigued but actually the scene brings down, I was talking about this yesterday with Teddy, a sort of a darker side to Niall, I mean Niall, um, Graham, because usually in the first couple of uh, drafts, to me, he came across as a little too innocent, too too much of a cardboard. Of course, that's because I when I see things on paper, it hasn't been fully developed yet, but yeah. In this scene, you really get to see a different side of Graham that no one really ever gets seen before. Can you maybe go a little depth into that one? That one scene. Yeah, you mean into into the thinking behind that scene? Yes. Yeah. Well, I think I think part of it is because you know I'm sitting here today watching the two of you, and um, and some of the parts the characters have been interchangeable, but you two have been with these parts from the beginning. Only you two all the way through, and so. I was really seeing, seeing you know the the great thing about this art form is that it's collaborative, and so um, I really was feeling like already like giving it away sooner than usual because we've we've worked together so much. So some of it came from actually what you just said there, Dan. You you mentioned um, you know adding some more dimensions to to Graham, and um, and then I think this idea of um, of not being innocent. Ted seems, or, or Niall sees him as innocent, right? At face glance, but um, part of Niall's uh, struggle is that he doesn't fully see his brother. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and, and as long as he only sees his brother as the one who got him beat up or like the one in the way of his life, um, they can't have a real relationship. They, they're actually not gonna know love um, as opposed to um, them just both accepting and understanding each other fully. So it was a, it was a scene, to, I mean, this is kind of an ensemble play. It is about three siblings, but there are a few other characters that are pretty um, primary. And so um, this was something, ensemble plays are hard to write because you have limited real estate. Um, but I noticed I cut some scenes that I liked, but actually weren't telling the story of the brothers and the siblings. So that's why I put that in. Absolutely. And, and I noticed Niles given a little more of a maybe not much of a sympathetic, but more of a realistic approach rather than just him trying to be uh, trying to be sarcastic to keep his true feelings inside. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and also to speak to Niall, I think another conversation Dan and I, I had recently, since we have been with these characters so long, is sometimes it is hard to separate you know, because they're all an amalgamation of the company and the conversations. So there are pieces of us in every, every character um, 
but it is it is interesting when you've been with one for so long not to i identify nile sometimes when i talk about him i talk about it in the i form and and um and then i have to take ownership of his flaws um and i do think this scene is exciting because in the context of the play you realize the parents are not present nile's trying to plan a wedding and go through grad school while managing a non-verbal uh teenage girl and a very verbal uh, a 20 something uh, brother and uh, and um, I think something that Clay who directed this pointed out to me recently while we were working on it is um, I, that I didn't even come to mind is that he can only study and work on his grad school stuff at night because he has to be with these people all day and it did make me feel for him a bit more because uh, he definitely has a lot of growth to do uh, from this scene to the rest of the play. Um, and uh, yeah, I, that's, I saw, I saw, sorry, I started, this is one of the tangents that start to. <laughs> I have a question for you two. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. yeah. Um, so usually when I write, um, when I hear the word, I have, hear the word remember come out of a character's voice, I'm like, oh, great all the actions happening off stage it's not active and this one but i but i i i wanted to um i wanted this one that felt like the memory was active um and i'm wondering just if that came through for you what what it was like to play something now graham and nile talking about graham and nile some some years ago what challenge was that to make that active did it did it feel like to what degree it it still helped us see them as growing um, forward moving humans in the world. I, I think real quick before I pass it off to Dan, um, just to almost continue my point, we've been with them for so long. Uh, for me as an actor, it was kind of easy to be able to think of history with these characters because I have history with these characters. Um, uh, and for me, it's active because I think this is like, you know, like any play, um, any story we're putting on stage, I think there's always this um, piece of the ingredients that are, that, that are um, something's about to change or something has never happened before. And this is what this is you're witnessing it. And um, uh, this scene seems to kind of like uh, explore a darker um, moment in these siblings lives and and but it's something that I think Niall has to kind of deal with on a regular basis if Graham's schedule gets flummoxed or if he gets up or is it perturbed in some way it you know they have to have this conversation and it seems that in my impression of it that Graham does bring this up a lot because it affects him and in, in the examples that Niall gives so it's like um this is, I think, in some ways, the baseline of these characters' relationship that needs to change by the end of the play. Um, so for me, it's very active because it's informative of their relationship compared to in the earlier scenes where you see Graham being delightful and Niall is, is not warm, to put it kindly, I'd say. <laughs> um, Dan, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, it's true, Act what he's been pointing out because I have been with Graham for so long that it kind of starts to wear into you but one of the things I've also discovered during the scene is sort of the difference between him and me that I have to emulate because keep in mind I grew up with a family who's always been around for me I had a father who always worked and then came back home whenever I need to a mom that gave up a career to stay home with me and two siblings that helped me give the tools to what I need but it also made me think of the frustrating time I had with them. So I've kind of sort of tried to emulate that, but still understand the difference between Graham and I, which is we really didn't have the parents around for us. So it kind of made, made it a really hard scene to do, but it kind of gave me a side of Graham, Graham and Niall's relationship that I felt like needed to be talked about, whether it's in the early script, it's not really touched upon. And I feel like this, I don't know how to explain this, but I feel like it's one of those memory bits where he feels like he's kind of not suffering from PTSD, but kind of feeling the ghost of the past sort of haunt that particular memory of him. And that, that mark is sort of like the uh, mark of Cain. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, I think I just wanna, since we only have a few more minutes, um, 
Uh, Jeremy, I wanted to get your thoughts on the Neurodiversity New Play Festival. You helped us organize this. Um, you know, what do you think of the work we are trying to do this year? Given everything, we've made a lot of adjustments um, with COVID and social distancing. Um, what are your hopes for the future of this festival? And like, what, what, are, what were the challenges and opportunities this time around? Um, well, I, I think the, the, you know, I think that Clay's vision and the vision of the ensemble has been, is always um, really empowering and affirming and the kind of sort of um, initiative and people and work I wanna be around. So um, it's been great to get to be a part of it. And um, my, my role specifically was focused on um, drawing in some other playwrights um, to write some of the short plays. And um, you know, to me, whenever, whenever there's collaboration, uh, it's an opportunity to kind of mix it with some people who maybe, maybe you don't, I don't know as well. And um, maybe people who, this is an opportunity. And, and so, um, you know, I've looked at where um, this need of, uh, of creating voice and um, a space for uh, neurodiverse stories um, is really exciting. And to be able to tell the multi-layered, diverse, um, textured depth of stories so that it doesn't become singular. I think when um, I, uh, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie says it best in a TED talk and other, other places where she talks about the danger of a single story. When we only have one story of a neurodiverse person that becomes reductive and can be in a, a danger akin to erasure or silence or no story. And so this is, uh, to me, a push to do that and a push to sort of, to also collaborate across many lines of difference while also um, paradoxically centering neurodiversity without, um, without reducing the, the emotional truths and human condition of all characters, whether they be on the spectrum or otherwise. Yep, absolutely. And to add on that, actually, actually, I was telling Teddy this the other day, I think of art in the way of like a pie. On the top, you have the plays about certain topic from a certain other grouping, like a neurotypical, neuroatypical. But the thing that has to be important is the filling, which has to work together with the crust to make the pie a delicious thing. If that filling is empty or worthless, it's gonna all fall apart. So I feel like that's what we're trying to do here. Absolutely. I think of it with neurodiversity, which is neither neurodivergent exclusive or neurotypical exclusive. It's both of them together, which as Clay likes to say, means basically if you're willing and 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 impassioned by theater, join us. Like you're you're you fall, you fit the criteria. If, if, and um um, and I think just to some of your points, another thing we often say is, because it's a challenge when we're dealing with some of these uh, topics and trying to bring more inclusion into theater, um, that we sometimes we have to show the world as it is, not as it should be. We know as the world as it should be. And we'd like to tell this narrative, and I think this goes to your, your point, Jeremy, about not, you know, avoiding a reductive narrative is that like, um, I think our focus in our company is, is supporting adults. And um, what happens a lot with uh, disability is uh, people are not allowed to be seen as adults and treated as adults. And um, I mean, to bring it back to this play, I think that's part of Niles' issue is not recognizing that his family's growing up and he can grow up with them or he could get left behind. Um, and uh, so uh, I think it is, it, this is the first step to building into the American canon more uh, understanding of neurodiversity. Uh, my last rambling point I think I'd make about it is that I, I think what Spectrum Theater has taught me and working on this play in particular has taught me is that in reality, truth is a big rock. It's a big, big rock. And if you're on one side of it, you can say it's sunny and that's absolutely true. But if you're on the other side of the rock and you're in the shade, and you say it's in shadows, that's absolutely true. And so one way to combat one perspective 
and if you have a neurodiverse community, it feels like you're all holding hands and looking at the rock from every single side. And it takes a little bit more time and more understanding and a little patience, but you get to see the whole picture in a much different way. Um, I know, I came into this with this uh, uh, feeling of being altruistic or like, I'm an artist and I'm gonna help people. And um, I know that being in a neurodiverse group, um, it's helped me in more ways than I could possibly uh, explain uh, in growth as a person and um, in just feeling fulfilled in life. Um, so I, I know for me as like associate artistic director of Spectrum Theater Ensemble, it was frustrating that we had to kind of uh, and understandably and safely, you know, social distance and we had to kind of cancel. We had these big plans for this festival with workshops. Um, I was just joking with Clay, like we kind of were missing out on the adult summer camp we had planned. Uh, to, and, um, and we had to kind of uh, adjust uh, with everything. But our plans for the future are to uh, bring this full force. Um, and do a festival, uh, you know, once it's safe, uh, with everyone together, spreading uh, awareness in the community. And most importantly, and Jeremy, it, perhaps you could speak to this, one of our goals is to build into the American canon neurodiver neurodivergent voices um, uh, and actually publish the work we're working on. Um, uh, I could you could you speak maybe like I think like you were saying about the reductive nature of of storytelling. Um, could you speak to the strategy that we might be going about and doing that, or um, uh, uh, any kind of steps that we need to take to infuse this uh, into the wider culture, if that makes sense? Yeah, um, it's a good question. I think that my my first thought is. Uh, keep going more, right? Like making this, building this into an institution this summer um, plan and and look, being able to look 10 years from now, look back and see all the, the contributors as artists and writers. I think that will take you to the place of it. I think what, what I'm hearing you say is when we use the word publish, it's like, how do you like leave a mark? How do you um, claim space? Um, so I think it's that. I also think it's, um, I think it's also work to be done with, with advocates, advocacy. It's not just making art, but it's advocacy with other institutions that already exist to be able to see beyond what, to, to extend their imagination. And some of that can happen by getting them to participate in this, events like this, Spectrum Theater Ensemble productions, or to attend them. But some of that also happens in, um, you know, compelling them to, to look at their own work. And it's not just Spectrum Theater Ensemble of uh, which it's incumbent upon to tell neurodiverse stories. Um, it's Spectrum Theater Ensemble hopefully will propel other um, theater, all, all forms of stories to look at how, how they're representing neurodiversity um, and I would even take that further into, um, you know, looking at we're living in a world where we have to talk about things in intersectionality. So how are we telling stories that are uh, racially diverse? Um, that is a reckoning that has come to the fore after 400 years. And, um, and, and in addition, uh, different sort of abilities and um, uh, sexuality, gender, like you can go all the things that make us human. Um, I think when you have a group like Spectrum, Spectrum Theater Ensemble, we are compelling everyone to encompass and look at our full humanity, whether that is in your mission, if that's not in your mission explicitly, um, maybe it needs to be there. Maybe it needs to be there for, for um, this, this word intersection is, uh, intersectionality is a, is a real gift to be able to have the language for how these things come together. And so, yeah, so more, more art, more advocacy um, is my answer. Well, actually, and that's a beautiful segue. And I'd love, uh, Dan, not to throw you for a loop, but could you really briefly 
uh, tell me about what sensory friendly programming is. That's another thing that we advocate ah. for. We do a lot of, our, our, all of our shows um, have at least a couple productions that are adjusted um, or at least, uh, and I know Cuckoo's Nest, all of them at least had some uh, indicators and um, uh, 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 sensory overload warnings. Uh, so could you, could you just give me like an overview of what sensory friendly means? Gladly. So for years, the theater community had been doing something called sensory friendly theater, but it's mostly aimed at kids shows. They, they modify production, take out anything that might be too loud, too bright. But what we try to do in Spectrum Theater Ensemble, and I also do this work down at Trinity Rep, is we try to create a space where it's like a perform same performance, only with a few accommodations. So we create a trigger list of things that come up ahead, such as abrupt lighting cues, abrupt sounds, abrupt any sounds or movements. And for those moments with really intense sound cues, on each side of the stage, depending on which space we're in at Spectrum Theater Ensemble, there's a red light that goes off 15 seconds before that actually happens. We also do a Sensory Friendly Plus performance, which was the same as the original Sensory Friendly, only modify for families, people who may not be able to handle other things that could sensory mess them up. Absolutely. Oh, maybe messed up isn't the word I'm looking for, just like sort of throw them, off, throw them off. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I know with the Sensory Friendly Plus, we um, yeah, have a little bit more time for people to meet their seats. There's a table off to the side with some stimming activities. Um, the actors come through for a costume uh, a parade so that people can see them first and, and not have any uh, major surprises. Um, but I do know another issue with Sensory Friendly is how do institutions codify or have a, a checklist to really see how they're doing with sensory friendly. And so another thing that we are trying to get off the ground and we have um, some uh, exciting prospects in the future is our NICE program. Uh, and this is a mouthful, so bear with me. It's Neurodiverse Inclusive Certified Entertainment on the first try. Uh, <laughs> um, and that is headed by our managing director, Troy Battle, um, who's been getting a lot of help from Gavin Petty. And they're basically creating a system by which we can consult, give a grading system, and help institutions like theaters, um, any place where there's entertainment, amusement parks, even museums. And so I think, uh, uh, Jeremy, this was going to something you were saying before, is how can institutions look at themselves um, the NICE program is meant to be something that we can teach uh, people in the area to then teach other people in the area. Um, we're hoping it spread, I apologize for this metaphor, but we're hoping it spreads like wildfire um, and that we can uh, help a myriad of institutions become uh, more inviting to everybody. Um, and I think, uh, I really appreciate this conversation. Um, this has been a really lovely time. Jeremy, it's always great to see you. Um, I, we just have a couple more minutes. Um, so I, do, I did wanna say uh, thank you for joining us uh, if you're watching right now. Uh, if you can, if you are able, please donate to us. We are uh, hoping to keep doing the work and keep on inviting more voices to the table. Um, Thank you for taking a chance on us. We will always take a chance on you and we will always be having open doors. Um, up soon, we have a, another original work by Michael John Carley called Pierto's Magic Radio, which I have to get ready for. <laughs> um, uh, that's at 3.30. Um, the, this, this festival is continuing on until six tonight and we have another day tomorrow. Ooh, I'm very excited. Uh, so yes, please go to our Facebook page or go to our website, stensemble.org uh, and donate if you are able. And um, if you please reach out to us, if you, uh, you know, want to collaborate, we're always looking for friends. We're looking for contributors. Um, there's a, multiple ways you can help artistically, financially, uh, using your skills, your time, your advocacy. And I know one thing this group has taught me is examining your self biases. It's okay to be wrong is one thing STE has taught me. It's okay to 
approach something incorrectly with the best of intentions, so long as you're willing to adjust and listen to the community you're affecting. Um, we're going through a seismic shift in our culture and in theater as well. And I think now is the best time to make sure that, to build long tables and to make sure everyone has a seat at it. There's no reason, inclusion is inclusion is inclusion. If you're working through inclusion, there's no exclusion. That's that's it. I, I uh, you know, we've heard these conversations of people fearing being left out. I've learned STE is proof to me that if if you're willing to work at it, everyone has a place. Uh, so, Jeremy, thank you for joining us. Dan, it's always a pleasure. Uh, Likewise, thank you, uh, thank you to our interpreter, uh, and we will be back in just about 14 minutes. Bye everybody. Thank you.